Good afternoon, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started today. Uh, we'll be here from 1.15 till approximately 2.30. Uh, if we are disconnected for more than 10 minutes, please check your canvas for uh, information a little bit later. Okay, so we are now recording. Uh, this is our attendance check-in at this time. Please type present for your attendance. If you did not sign in with your full name, be sure to include it in the message. Thank you. It looks like everyone has checked in for the most part now. Let's go ahead and continue. And I'll check back a little bit later, make sure that if someone pops in, uh, that they do send me a message that they are uh, present here for today's session. So let's do a quick review of some of the things that we covered during the last session we were together. Uh, so last session, we reviewed psychology as a science, uh, its empirical approach, uh, looked at critical thinking, how it is that you should analyze information that is being presented to you. We also talked about the scientific attitude, the attitude of such things as curiosity, skepticism, and humility. We also talked about the history of psychology, starting off with Wilhelm Wundt's lab that he established in 1879 in Germany, uh, and the early schools of thought, such as structuralism and functionalism and some of the individuals associated with those early schools of thought. We also talked about women and their role in the early days of psychology. It was not a very diverse field at the time, mostly filled with uh, men who were white. Uh, we did see women attend certain schools and go through the same programs as their male counterparts, but were denied a degree because of them being female. Uh, now that has changed in recent time, most definitely. We also discussed psychology as a maturing science, focusing on the three major movements in our history of, uh, as a mature science, behaviorism, the Freudian movement, and humanism. And humanism uh, was a reaction to both the behaviorist school of thought uh, and movement and the Freudian school of thought and, it, and its movement. So humanism wanted to focus more on people's self-determination of being human beings in free will. Then we looked at contemporary psychology and some of the things that had a great deal of influence on psychology as it is today. We looked at the cognitive revolution, primarily looking at such things as uh, technology that had a great influence on being able to see what types of things are going on in the brain or the mind. We also looked at uh, the role of evolutionary psychology and things of that nature. We also examined the levels of analysis, looking at the biopsychosocial levels of analysis and how we can look at any type of behavior or mental process and how we can look at the biological factors that influence it, the psychological factors that influence it, and the social cultural factor factors that influence it as well. Then we ended by looking at the subfields of psychology, looking at basic research whose primary role is to just gain knowledge for knowledge's sake, and applied psychology or applied research whose goal is to try to solve problems, practical problems, for example, in the workplace. We looked at professional areas too, subfields of psychology, such as counseling, which help people with problems in living a greater uh, well-being and establishing themselves more properly in their own eyes, as well as clinical psychology to assess and treat people with psychological disorders. So today we'll continue our conversation with thinking critically with psychological science, as well as focus on parts that we stopped uh, looking at uh, during the last session. We stopped at the need for psychological science and that's where we'll pick up. So the need for psychological science, roadblocks in post-truth world. Some of these items may seem very relevant to you because we've seen some of them pop up over the last year or two. So first we want to look at what we talked about last time, the uh, critical thinking. And remember critical thinking involved analyzing information, arguments and conclusions to decide if they make sense rather than simply accepting it. And there are gonna be certain roadblocks that will prevent you from doing critical analysis, analysis from time to time. One of them is gonna be hindsight bias. 
also known as I, I knew it all along phenomenon. Once you have this, once you know the outcome of a certain event, you will then go back into the time machine, so to speak, and readjust what your beliefs were prior to the outcome of that event. So hindsight bias is basically you saying, I knew it was going to be this way all along. Uh, one good example that I remember quite readily is uh, a term that you may have heard of before called Monday morning quarterbacking. Most professional football games are played on Sunday. And then when people get to work on Monday, they'll talk about the games that occurred on Sunday. And sometimes people will say, well, they should have done that last play. I would have done something totally different and the results would have turned out totally in our favor. Now, that usually is an indication of a high, hindsight bias. Because you knew exactly what happened, you can adjust your own reality and your own memory in a sense to say that you knew what was gonna happen all along. So that is a bias that we tend to have as human beings. Another bias we have is that of overconfidence. When someone truly believes that they know more than they actually do, okay? So that's when someone you know is saying something that may be wrong, but they really believe they have the right answer. We do tend to, from time to time, have this overconfidence to think that we know more than we do. The other one that we talk about is perceiving patterns in random events. A random sequence is seen as unsettling to us naturally, so we don't like that. We don't like that type of chaos. And so we want to make sense, and we make sense and create calm by seeing patterns in these random events. So the baseball player, the baseball pitcher who won the last two games and realized that he wore the same socks, he may continually wear those socks for the rest of the, the season because he's seeing that those, that's a pattern. He has his luck working with him. He's seeing these patterns and these somewhat random events. So we are more likely to see these things in order to make ourselves feel a little bit better, even though the patterns are not there. They are truly just random events. Scientific inquiry can help us sift reality from overestimated intuition and delusion. And that's one of the things that we see being combated even today. Science, as we will see and have learned already so far in this course, is about trying to ascertain the truth, big T truth, as opposed to little t truth, what we may personally believe is true based on our own personal reality. So what we see here, as we move on with this topic, we look at the following. Psycho psychological science of this post-truth world. Why are we so vulnerable to believing untruths? Now, some of these things, again, unfortunately, we've heard a lot about this stuff recently, but this has been part of the foundation of, of psychology and why we need to have psychology for some time. One of these ideas is fake news. And what they really mean by this is intentionally provided misinformation. As I talked about last class about critical thinking, people may want you to be persuaded or provide money for a service or a product or to believe in them. And sometimes in order to try to persuade you or convince you, they can provide you with misinformation and critical thinking is trying to give you the skill set to avoid that from happening. So with fake news, quote, this intentionally provided misinformation is to try to muddy the waters so that you can be persuaded or convinced in one way or another. The other idea is repetition. Now, repetition is the notion that we have a repeated statements become more and more believable the more you hear them. So you can have somebody provide you with a story about something that can be sound very outlandish, but if the story is repeated over and over again, it becomes more believable to us. So repetition leads to us believing it more and more. It sort of like gets into the cracks of our, pers our personality in a sense, and we start to believe it. The other item in this post-truth world is availability of powerful examples. When someone tells you, well, I read this somewhere, an anecdote and forged you a message or some sort of story somehow, it's usually going to be something that is very vivid and the story will gain attention. Sometimes the crazier it is, the more available it is, the more it's being promoted and repeated, the more it's always in your mind. And again, as we see, when things are repeated in your mind more and more, it becomes more and more possible to believe it. So we have fake news, repetition, 
availability, and the other one is called group identity and the echo chamber of the like-minded. Here we have groups and news that affirm our views are accepted. News sources that do not are demonized. So groups and news that affirm our views are accepted. And one of the things that leads to is this. When you have people that share your ideas or your beliefs about something, and you have a website or news source, you go to that website or that news source. That's just the way it is. And then you dislike the ones that do not go that because the same thing is being discussed in those websites of the like-minded. This next graph really gives you a really good illustration as to what happens. And we'll talk more about this type of stuff when we get to chapter on social psychology a little bit later. I'll give you one of the, the studies from that to help explain it a little bit more. But here you see uh, on social media, most people discuss very contentious issues such as gun control, same-sex marriage, climate change, and all that type of stuff. They discuss it only with fellow group members. In one Twitter analysis, people overwhelmingly sent messages to and retweeted messages from people who share their liberal blue or conservative red ideology. And so what you can see that is not happening in this graph here is that you don't see a lot of significant overlap between the red and blue. You see the blues cluster together and the reds cluster together with a few blues and maybe a few reds seen in some of the other big cluster. But what this basically shows us is that these individuals are only going to sources that are already holding their specific ideologies, their, their own attitudes. Now, let me give you a little bit of a, a social psychological study that was done on this particular idea. They would give a bunch of people a, a survey, a questionnaire to measure the level of prejudice, for example. And so they would get prejudice levels for this group of people. And then some people would score low on prejudice and some people would score high on prejudice. And then what they did is they got all the low scores together and into a discussion group and all the high scores together in a discussion group. And then after discussions with their like-minded colleagues, they then rated them again on their level of prejudice. Do you think, and I'm asking you as this is a question, do you think they became uh, more prejudice or less prejudice? So the people who are low prejudice, did they become more prejudice or less prejudice? And the people who are high prejudice, did they become less prejudice or, or even more prejudice? What are some of your ideas? You can, you can text me or speak up. Anyone have any ideas on that? Um, yeah, I got a comment on that. Sure. I feel like people, um, just the way their mind works, they, they look for things that attract the way they, they think and believe. And as they start to look at more comments and see more opinions, they only attract the ones that, that attend to, you know, to what they see. And then that kind of just goes afire and how they believe and kind of really just gives them – almost like a bigger voice and a bigger reason, you know, almost like, you know, an acceptance, even though it's from a random person, like, oh, a self-acceptance of what they think. And that makes them voice itself louder and just feel more confident in what that is, no matter if it's right or wrong. And, and that's what we basically see. In psychology, we call this group polarization. And basically what polarization means is the people get further and further away. They clutch together with like-minded individuals pulling further and further away from people who have different ideas. And that's what we see in this graph. And so when the low prejudice people got together speaking with other low prejudice people, and then they were rated later, their prejudice scores got even lower. When higher prejudice people were uh, together discussing issues, and then they were rated later, they became even higher in their prejudice level. So we saw they just became more of what they already were. And so we'll see more about that when we get to the area on social psychology. But this is one of the things that, that uh, we have to sort of deal with. Uh, this polarization has occurred not only in our country, but around the world. And it gets become very, very difficult to communicate uh, at a plain level with, with people from time to time. So good comments there. All right, so basically, after we see that, we've established that there are gonna be numerous challenges 
to us seeing what we refer to as big T or big truth, as opposed to L little t or little truth. This leads us to the scientific method. And what this scientific method is, and this is one of the key things here, science is about truth. And we try to arrange everything in the scientific method in our research in order to be able to ascertain the truth as much as possible. So how psychologists ask and answer questions, the scientific method. The scientific method is the process of testing our ideas about the world by turning our theories into testable predictions, and we'll see more about theories in a bit, turning our theories into testable predictions, how we see the world sort of fits together, gather information related to our predictions. So we have these predictions based on this theory, and then these predictions, we want to see if we can gather information related to our predictions and analyze whether the data fits with our ideas. So we come up with theories, we come up with hypotheses or predictions, we gather data, and then we see if the data that we gather from the world out there gives us support for what we believe. So if the data does not fit our ideas, then we modify our hypothesis, our educated guess or our predictions. We set up a study or experiment and try again to see if the world fits our predictions. But everything we do we're doing to try to get to some sort of master truth. And that's the key thing that I, I want to try to emphasize here. Truth is going to be the key thing that drives science together. Remember, we talked about these ideas previously in, in the previous lecture, when we talked about the scientific attitude, one of uh, curiosity, skepticism, and humility, okay? Remember, humility is, is that you're okay, you don't like it, but you're okay and understanding that sometimes you can be wrong. And so we understand that. So when we design research and experimentations, we design it with that idea uh, already in place in our minds. Now, getting a little bit more deeper into what we mean by theory, for example, the big picture. A theory in the language of science is a set of principles built on observations and other verifiable facts. So it's not just wild guesses or anything like that, you have some data to back it up. You have information, things that have been quantified or quantifiable in some way. So we have these verifiable facts that explain some phenomena and predicts its future behavior. That's a theory. So it sort of helps to explain the types of things that you can observe and see in the world. Now, as an example of a theory, we have the following. All ADHD, and this stands for all attention deficit hyperacti hyper, uh, uh, dis disorders, hyperactivity disorder symptoms are a reaction to eating sugar. So that could be something to explain symptoms that you may have seen out in the world to explain what you see in front of you. So all ADHD symptoms are a reaction to eating sugar. That's the theory. So then we come up with predictions or hypotheses based on that theory. A hypothesis is a testable prediction consistent with our theory. Testable here means that the hypothesis is stated in a way that we could make observations to find out if it is true. All right, we wanna find out if it is true. So we do the following. What would be a prediction from the all ADHD is about sugar theory? So we can come up with one like this. One hypothesis, if a kid gets sugar, the kid will act more distracted, impulsive, and hyper. If a kid gets sugar, the kid will act more distracted, impulsive, and hyper. They will indicate more symptoms of this thing called ADHD. To test the all part of the theory, ADHD symptoms will continue for some kids even after the sugar is removed from the diet. Well, think about what that means. If they say it's all about the sugar and then the sugar is removed from the diet and yet they still have those symptoms, that's a big oops, right? Well, that leads us to a very important idea. In science and in research, we design our research, we build it so that we can fail, that we can be disproved. And that's a very important idea. And that's what really makes science science. You have a good chance 
to be proven incorrect, that your idea, your theory may be wrong. So you design experiment and research in such a way that you have a good chance of being proven wrong. You allow that possibility to occur. And so if you do the research or conduct the experiment and the results turn out in your favor, meaning that your hypothesis was uh, supported, your theory was supported, it makes your case even stronger because you designed your research slash experiment in such a way that you could have been proven wrong, but in this instance you weren't. So we now have these hypotheses or hypotheses and we want to test them. Now there's going to be some danger when testing hypotheses because theories can bias our observations because we are already biased because we came up with the theory. We obviously want the theory to work, but we have to rely on our ethics, okay, our, our scientific attitude to make sure that we do the steps necessary to make sure that we prove our case when we do the research. So we can be biased and we are biased and we need to watch out for that. We might select only the data or the interpretations of the data that support what we already believe. There are safeguards against this. And one of the safeguards is that hypotheses, as I stated, hypotheses are designed to disconfirm, not confirm. We wanna have a, a hypothesis there to prove it wrong, okay? And so when we fail to prove it wrong, that gives support to what we believe was going on. All right, so hypotheses are designed to disconfirm. Now, this other thing that we need to talk about is called operational definitions. When we talked about things like impulsivity or hyperactivity or inattention or talk about self-esteem or anxiety, these are conceptual terms. They don't really have real meaning to us at times until we can operationally define them. And what we mean by operationally define them is to make them concrete so that we can train people to look out for them. So let's say we're doing this study on ADHD and we're in an elementary school doing research there. And we want to operationally define such things as impulsivity, hyperactivity, and inattention. So how can we measure these ADHD symptoms in this previous example in observable terms? We do so by making them concrete. So what we decide is the following. Impulsivity would be the number of times per hour a student calling out without raising their hand. So you can imagine sort of a, like an elementary school classroom where there are protocols to follow. And so this student does not follow the protocol. They act impulsively. Or we also can have hyperactivity equals the number of times per hour they're out of their seats. So they're supposed to remain in their seats. How many times are they out of their seats? You can imagine a scenario like this, they could probably have a video camera set up in the classroom and they are watching the videos, maybe two or three raiders watching the video and counting the number of impulsivity marks, the number of hyperactivity marks and so on. And then we have inattention the number of minutes continuously on task before becoming distracted. So you mark that each time that event occurs. So now what you have, you have this theory, you have the hypotheses, and now you have a way to make it measurable by having these operational definitions. That in a nutshell really tells us a lot. We have the theory, the hypothesis, and the way to measure uh, the things that we're interested in in our study. So the idea then is, let's say we can we complete the study, we collect the data and, and analyze the data and all that type of stuff, that's wonderful. But there's another important step, final step in the scientific method, and it's called replication. Replicating research means trying the methods of a study again, but with different participants or situations to see if the same results happen. You can introduce a small change in the study, for example, trying the ADHD sugar test on college students as opposed to elementary students. So that would be one way. Now, let me give you another reason why replication is very important. Do you ever think people lie in research? Well, yes, because the researchers, the psychologists, there are people and sometimes they do wrong things. Replication is a check and balance too. The way it is when you conduct a study, you lay everything out in such a way that it's like a recipe. 
and you share that recipe openly with anyone who's interested, anyone who reads the journal article based on your re research, they will have the recipe too. If there's something that's not mentioned there, they can write you and request you give them information. You're supposed to give them that information. So the idea is this, let's say somebody comes up with this study and the study was amazing. It was a beautiful study. The results were just out, outstanding. And then it was one study of a kind and then people started to try to replicate it. And then four people replicated, five people replicated. Let's say there are 12 replication studies and nobody was able to find out what the original study did. That's a big red flag. That suggests that that original study maybe had something really wrong with it. Maybe they made some egregious error or they faked the data somehow. So replication is not only just trying to see how the results may generalize to other groups, but also is a check and balance on the research community itself. So replication is a very important process. So let's look at this full picture of what we meant by this research process that we've just described to you. So we start off with theories. These theories suggest to and lead to hypotheses. The hypothesis then we design studies and research to test these hypotheses. The results then can either confirm, reject, or revise our theory. So for example, here we have a theory that sleep boosts memory. The idea if you get enough sleep, your memory is gonna be more efficient and more effective. So that leads to a hypothesis such as this. When sleep deprived, people remember less from the day before. That's a hypothesis, that is a prediction. That if you have some people and they are sleep deprived, they will remember less than from the day before. So you then, from that hypothesis, you arrange a research study. So you give study material to people. The people are gonna be divided into two groups. One group will get an ample night's sleep after they get the study material. The other group will have a short night's sleep and then there will be a test. They'll test and then we'll see whether or not the people who got a good night's sleep, did they remember more compared to the ones who got a, a, a poor night's sleep and see if that works. So depending on how it works out, we can either confirm our theory, find information that says we probably need to reject our theory or maybe tweak our theory a little bit and revise it. I'm gonna pause there to see if there are any questions or comments so far. You can speak up or send me a chat message. Okay, we all seem to be okay. All right, good. So now that we've covered theory, hypothesis, operational definitions and replication, we can now move on to research goals and types, description, correlation, prediction, causation and experiments or research methodologies that can be employed. So the research methods that we're going to examine here are gonna be descriptive research, correlational research, and then experimental research. Now, descriptive research. Descriptive research is a systematic objective observation of people. You're just somehow using some methodology observing people in some way. The goal is to provide a clear, accurate picture of people's behaviors, thoughts, and attributes. Behaviors, thoughts, and attributes. Here are some of the strategies for gathering this information. Case study, observing and gathering information to compile an in-depth study of one individual. Naturalistic observation, gathering data about behavior, watching but not intervening. And surveys and interviews, having other people report on their own attitudes and behaviors. So let's look at these a little bit more closely. So in a case study, we can examine one individual in depth or a group of people in depth. The benefit can be a source of ideas about human nature in general. So you could get a lot of rich information about the individual or the group that, you're, uh, that you are observing or researching. Okay, that's great, it's a great benefit of it. So one example would be cases of brain damage have suggested that functions of different parts of the brain. So we learned a lot 
uh, from from earlier and earlier centuries where people were curious as to why uh, this person, when they knew they were alive, they behaved in such a way. And what they would do, they some curious individuals would get a hold of that person's body and then, believe it or not, do an autopsy on them for the point of explore, for the, with the point of exploratory research to find out how their brain may have differed from somebody else's brain who did not have that type of affliction or behave in such a way. Uh, one individual that we can see in this graph here is Phineas Gage. He was a, a railroad worker who had a metal bar uh, impaled into his head and he survived. Uh, he was not the same after that happened, but that was one of the things that we, we understood from early on that this person's behavior was drastically different after he went through this particular accident. Once this bar impaled his head, he was no longer the same type of individual. He behaved much differently. Now, case studies are wonderful and great, they are rich information, but they do represent a potential danger, and that is the overgeneralization from one example. So what this basically means is that you only have a subject size of one, and no matter how wonderful the study may be or the research things that you may be gathering from this individual, one is just not sufficient number to generalize the larger population. So in this example, Joe got better after tapping his foot. So tapping must be the key to health. Well, that makes no sense. But let me give you a really crazy example. Let's say there's aliens around. Let's say aliens are real. And let's say uh, one day on campus at night, uh, one of our colleagues, a uh, FSU student, uh, a basketball player, for example, is walking to his dorm. An alien ship comes, zips by, beams him up, and then analyzes him researches him, find out all they can about him, put him back down on the planet with no memory, and then zip back off to the galaxy where they came from, and they're gonna to return to their home planet and say, we've learned all we need to know about human beings, and this is what we know. That human beings are, have very little body fat. They stand about six foot seven in height, uh, mostly muscle, okay? Uh, seem to be very in muscular condition. And well, see, the problem with that is that we grabbed our, they grabbed the basketball player who was an athlete who was not like a lot of people in the world. So you cannot use that one person to generalize to a larger population. And that's one thing that case studies cannot do. You cannot generalize to larger populations. So it's only for that limited person or group, okay? And that's all you can really say about it. So the other thing that we can do <clears throat> as part of the script, descriptive methodology is uh, observing natural behavior. And this means just watching and taking notes and not trying to change anything. Now, when people know they're being observed, that changes their behavior. If there's a question. Uh, do you have a question, Taylor? Yes, um, are all case studies with the subject size of one? No, I, I've read where there are some case studies that it just means that there are a very limited group. So it may be a larger group, okay? But it's a very unique and you can't get more of those groups. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so normally though, we usually see one as the example of a case study. And we see a lot of that uh, sample size of one or a very small number in uh, uh, applied behavioral analysis, uh, people who work at uh, institutions with behavior modification. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, okay? All right, so this method can be used to study more than one individual and to find truths that apply to a broader population. So here, you're not just studying one, you can be studying whole groups of people, okay? But you're doing it sort of on the sly. One thing that I, I sort of bring up and have brought up for years just to give people a, something that they can relate to probably, if you've ever been at a very busy department store or, or, or store like Walmart and the parking spaces are mostly full and you are coming out and you're seeing this, this play out where you see somebody is walking just there in their car and then somebody's waiting for their parking spot. Do you think those people who are about ready to leave that parking spot knowing that somebody is waiting for their spot, will they take longer or not? That's a question to you guys. <laughs> I feel like if somebody's waiting on a spot, you have a tendency to hurry up because you know that they're waiting. The actuality, what they found is that people tend to wait longer. Can you believe that? So what happens is 
people, yes. people, okay, so some people can relate to it. So people see somebody waiting, and when they did the naturalistic observation studies, they found that people were taking longer when somebody was waiting for them. But they were not taking as long when there was nobody waiting for them. So they backed out and went away quickly. But if somebody was waiting, it was almost like some sort of territorial response in a way. So with naturalistic observation, we can learn things about people, okay, from just observing their behavior. Now, I know that I'm, I'm a major people watcher when I had the time and would be out in public and stuff like that. I just sit on park bench and just watch people. And you can learn so much about people just by watching them behave in a natural environment with no belief that anybody's really observing them, which is a key thing because as soon as someone knows that you are observing them, the behavior tends to change. Okay, so that's naturalistic observation. The other thing that we talk about is the survey. And, and I'm sure that most of you have had this occasion where somebody calls you on the telephone at some inopportune time to take a survey or complete a survey. Now the survey it's a method of gathering information about many people's thoughts or behaviors through self-report rather than through observation. And there's a certain degree of attractiveness about doing a survey because you can get a lot of data, okay, real quickly by having people complete a survey. Now, the keys to getting useful information is this. Be careful about the wording of questions. Making sure that you're asking only one question making sure the question is clear, and the question does not have any social desirability there. And what we might, so we'll see about social desirability in a second. I'll give you an example. Okay, and only question randomly sampled people. Okay, so again, sometimes you can do a convenient sample people you have access to. Uh, they may not tell you the most uh, on how generalizable the results are, but surveys do have that wonderful benefit. Now, the word and effects, the results you get from a survey can change by your word selection. For example, do you have motivation to study hard for this course? People who may use a question like this are looking more for ambitious type of characteristics. Or do you feel a desire to study hard for this course? That would be looking maybe for lazy characteristics, if that makes any sense. But depending on how the question is phrased, there may, no be, may not be a correct answer. Let me give you a really crazy example here. Hopefully it doesn't offend anybody. But what if this was a survey question, okay, and the response was such as this. Question, have you stopped beating your spouse? Yes or no? There is no correct answer to that. The response is set up in such a way that whoever did that particular survey item could easily report that there is a rash of spouse beating and abuse going on in North Carolina uh, because all these people saying that they are, have beat their spouse or stopped beating their spouse. Let's think about the question. It's a yes or no response. And it's saying, have you stopped beating your spouse? If you say yes, that means you were beating, in the, beating your spouse in the past. If you say no, that means you still are beating your spouse. Now, that's a crazy extreme example, but questions can be phrased in really bad ways so that it almost dictates a certain response. Sometimes you can ask questions that may make you respond in a certain way because of social desirability. If, for example, they're asking you a very simple question about your alcohol juice or drug use, even though this may be an anonymous survey, you may feel a little bit iffy about telling the person the truth. Therefore, as opposed to saying five times a week or five times a month, you may say two times a month, okay? Because there's gonna be social desirability uh, forces on you there. So there are gonna be some wonderful things that we can learn from surveys, but obviously there are some issues that we have to watch out for uh, as well. Now, one key one is the following example here. What psychology science make, uh, mistake was made here? All right, this is a true thing that happened a long time ago before many of you, all of you were born, I'm sure. Uh, there was uh, Dewey defeats Truman. There was never a President Dewey in the United States. There was, however, a President Truman. And Harry Truman won. The Chicago Tribune interviewed people about whom they would vote for. 
So this was some time ago in the 1940s. All right, it's 1948. And so when they interviewed people how they would vote for, they did so by phone. Can anybody tell me the issue with interviewing people by phone in 1948? Any ideas? Not everybody had access to a phone. There you go. Mm -hmm. Not everyone had access to a phone. In fact, there would only be a select group of individuals who did have access to a phone. People wealthy and urban enough to have a phone in 1948 were indeed more likely to report having voted for Thomas Dewey, the Republican. Okay, so the issue came to be this. They only surveyed the Republicans during this time. And this Chicago Daily Tribune, having done that, made the prediction that Dewey was going to defeat Truman. It did not turn out that way because they did not have the proper sample. And that's one of the key things about surveys. It all depends on having the proper sample. Without the right sample, selected in the right way, your results mean nothing. So a lot of work is done in trying to acquire the right sample. Because once you know that, and this is hard to believe, it's almost like magic. If you select the sample in the right way from the right thousand people in the country, you can relatively predict with some degree of certainty what the rest of the country feels and looks like. All right, so this really depends a great deal on random sampling. If you want to find out something about men, you can't interview every single man on earth. That's not possible. The population is just going to be too large. Sampling saves time. You can find the ratio of colors in this jar by making sure they're all well mixed, randomized, and then taking a sample. So what this basically means is this, a random sampling is a technique for making sure that every individual in a population has an equal chance of being in your sample. Random means that your selection of participants is driven only by chance and not by any characteristic. So if you went into a room and said, well, I'm going to randomly walk into this room with this filled with students in this class, and I'm going to randomly just pick people by pointing at them, that would not be random. There would be a reason why you pick that person and pick that person. It may be arbitrary. It may be based on things that you're not even aware of, okay, but that's not random. So there's systems in place to help us select randomly from a population. And that random selection makes up for a whole host of issues. And one of the things that we'll see shortly is when you're starting an experiment and you have a population of people and you randomly assign them to a control group or an experimental group, and we'll talk more about that later, you assure by this random assignment that those groups, the control group and the experimental group are equivalent to each other. It's like magic in a way to me, but they are sure to be equivalent. So you're starting off in the same place. So we'll revisit sampling a little bit later as we go through this course from time to time. There are other uh, types of sampling too, to make sure, for example, that you have a, a stratified sample. So the sample is representative of the population in which you're pulling from. There are things that can be done to ensure that as well. But sampling is gonna be one of the key issues when you're trying to do surveys. And also, as we'll see a little bit later, doing research. Now let's talk about correlational research. So a possible result of many descriptive studies, the studies that we've just covered, like the case study and the natural observation and the survey, well, these, these, these studies can give us ideas about how things are correlated with one another. So the general definition is an observation that two traits or attributes are related to each other. Thus, they are co-related. The scientific definition, a measure of how closely two factors vary together or how well you can predict a change in one from observing the change in another. So in a case study, the fewer hours the boy was allowed to sleep, the more episodes of aggression he displayed. So that in essence sort of describes the relationship between sleep and aggression. And that's what's observation. Children in the classroom who were dressed in heavier clothes were more likely to fall asleep than those wearing lighter clothes. So amount of clothes and sleep behavior correlated. 
in a survey. The greater number of Facebook friends, the less time was spent studying. So Facebook friends and studying time, correlation. So again, correlations are everywhere and correlation is a very wonderful tool to allow us to see how uh, two factors or two variables may be associated with one another. So let's look at this a little bit more deeply here. We have the correlation coefficient is a number representing how closely and in what way two variables correlate or change together. Then we have the direction of the correlation can be positive, a direct relationship meaning both variables increase together or negative or an inverse relationship as one increases, the other decreases. The strength of the relationship is how tightly and predictable they vary together is measured in a number that varies from zero to plus or minus one. All right, so let's look at this. Guess the correlation coefficients. Height versus shoe size. Or do you think, just say yes or no, do you think that's correlated? Yes. Yes. No. All right, so basically that is close to one, a strong positive correlation, because basically what it comes down to, the your height and shoe size, you have to have larger feet to support a taller frame. That's just the way it is, all right? So that would be a close to a positive one or a strong positive correlation. Both variables go the same direction. As shoe size increase, so does height. As height increase, so does shoe size. Then we have years in school versus years in jail. Is that correlated? No. It actually is, but in an inverse relationship. So what this basically means is this, the fewer years in school, the more years in jail. The more years in school, the fewer years in jail. So basically it's sort of suggesting, we don't know if this is really the cause of this, it's suggesting that education may be a way to avoid getting into situations that may wind, wind, you getting up, wind up in jail, if that makes sense to you. So that's going to be close to a negative one correlation. So as one goes up, the other variable goes down. And then we have the following. Height versus intelligence. Is that correlated? No. No, and that is a true statement. So no is correct. It's close to zero. There's no obvious relationship or correlation between one's height and one's intelligence. So let's look a little closely here at some of the graphs here. So what we have at the very top of this is a perfect positive correlation. All those dots line up in a perfect row, a line. You have laid a line down, it would be perfect. So as one event increases, the second exactly increases. So when you have a correlation like this, you can predict with one variable what's going to, the other variable is going to be because it's a perfect correlation. So we can see 0.5 is less, it's no longer a straight line, but it's around like a little cigar there. When it gets to zero, it's all over the place. But then the negative 0.5 is like a little cigar, but it's going in the opposite direction. And the perfect negative correlation is like that straight line we saw up top, but going in the opposite direction. So a positive, perfect correlation, both variables go up together. A perfect negative correlation, as one variable goes up, the other variable goes down. That is how they co-vary. Now there's another important aspect of correlation that we want to make sure that you guys understand before we get out of here today. And it's going to be this one here. If we find a correlation, what conclusions can we draw from it? Let's say we find the following results. There is a positive correlation between two variables, ice cream sales and rates of violent crime. How do we explain this? And by the way, this is true. I'll leave it open to you to make some comment or type a comment if you have one. Think about it, what's going on here? Is it a transaction of sales? <laughs> Not a transaction of sales, anyone else? Oh, this ice cream was too expensive, it'll kill me somebody. No, that's not it. Now remember, this is a correlation. Okay, and what I'm trying to communicate here is this idea that we should emphasize, and it was emphasized to me in several graduate programs. Correlation, 
does not infer causation. Ice cream sales does not cause violent race and crime or violent homicidal tendencies. It does not. But they are positively correlated with one another. There's a strong positive correlation between ice cream sales and violent crime. How do we explain this? Basically, think about this. If it's not the, these two variables influencing each other, there must be a third variable that influences them both. And what would that be? Is it the weather of the area? It's the weather of the area. And I'll get more specific. It's going to be the heat. You have very rarely seen a wild ride go crazy in the middle of a winter and snowstorms. It doesn't happen. Most crime is going to happen when it's nice outside. Nice weather, usually somewhat hot. People may be a little bit frustrated. They start getting into fights or go out stalking against them. But also at the same time, when it's hot outside, what also goes, what sales increase when it's hot outside? Ice cream sales. Ice cream sales. So what we have here is a correlation, a strong correlation between ice cream sales and violent crime. But this is to emphasize that you can never infer causation from a correlation because in a correlation, you're only looking at two variables. There's some other variable out there that may be causing both of them, all right? So correlation is not causation. People who floss more regularly have less risk of heart disease. If this data is from a survey, can we conclude that flossing might prevent heart disease or that people with heart healthy habits also floss regularly? So we don't know, okay? It could be just easily that people who are more likely to floss have other positive habits that help their health as well. So people with bigger feet tend to be taller. Does this mean that having bigger feet causes height? No, we saw that earlier. So the notion here, is that simply because two things are correlated, we cannot say that one thing causes another. Here's another example. We'll go through this one quickly. If self-esteem, which is, is our sense of worth that we have about ourselves, and depression, when we don't seem to think we are a person of value, we're feeling down about our circumstances. If self-esteem correlates with depression, there are still numerous possible causal links. Self-esteem could cause depression, or depression could cause low self-esteem, or distressing events or biological predispositions could cause low self-esteem and depression. We don't know what, we don't know which. And with a correlation, because we're only looking at a piece of the puzzle at the time, we can't ascertain which is the one that may be the true cause. So again, this emphasizes that fact that correlation is not causation. All right, so next we talk about the key thing, this type of study that we can do that can tell us a little bit about causation, and that is experimental research. So how do we find out about causation? By experimentation. Manipulating one factor in a situation to determine its effect. So let's go back to this ADHD thing again. Testing the theory that ADHD equals sugar. Removing sugar from the diet of children with ADHD to see if it makes a difference. That's one way that we could do it. The depression self-esteem example. Trying interventions that improve self-esteem to see if they cause a reduction in depression. That's another way that we could test it. Now, the key thing about experimentation is the following. If we manipulate a variable in an experimental group of people, and then we see an effect how do we know the change wouldn't have happened anyway, all right? So how do we know that we changed something, but do we know that that change wouldn't have happened anyway? In order to solve that particular problem, we have the control group. We solve this problem by comparing this group to a control group, a group that is the same in every way except the one variable we are changing. Two groups of children have ADHD, but only one group stops eating refined sugar. So basically what that suggests is the following. We see that we have two groups. One stops eating sugar, one keeps eating sugar. Then we measure their symptoms later to see if the control group and the experimental group are the same still, or are they different? If they are different, the only thing would have 
been changed was that we made one stop eating sugar. So how do we make sure the control group is really identical in every way to the experimental group? By using random assignment. Randomly selecting some study participants to be assigned to the control group or the experimental group. So you have a population of ADHD children of the right age group, and then you randomly assign one to the control group and one to the experimental group. And when you do that, before you do anything else to that, those two groups, to that, that group, they are basically equivalent once you do that random assignment. They start out the same, and that's gonna be very important to all this research here, that they start off the same before you do anything. So to clarify two similar sounding terms, we had random sampling earlier. Random sampling is how you get a pool of research participants that represents the population you're trying to learn about. So you may random sample from a, a whole host of people who have ADHD. And so now you have a random sample of people who have ADHD. That's good, that's what you want. Then you have random assignment. A participant of control or experimental groups is how you control all variables except the one that you're manipulating. So now that you have your sample, you then randomly assign them to either the control group or the experimental group. And by doing so, the experimental group and the control group are equivalent to each other at that time. One other concept I wanna make sure we understand is the placebo effect. And I'm sure you've probably heard of the placebo effect before. How do we make sure that the experimental group doesn't experience an effect because they expect to experience it? Expectations are a very powerful thing. Let's say you take a friend out, let's say you're old enough, you're legal age, you can drink alcohol at, at, uh, at establishments. And you take a friend who just turned 21 and you take him to a bar and you tell the barkeep, this is my friend, he just turned 21. I want you to load him up with six Shirley Temples and he'll just down them one after the other. Shirley Temples is a drink. And let's say your friend downs five of the Shirley Temples and says, man, I'm almost wasted. I gotta go to the restroom, I'll be back. And he stumbles away. Does anybody know the issue with that? There's no alcohol. Yeah. Shirley Temples are non-alcoholic, bro. Thank you. Shirley Temples are non-alcoholic drinks. But if someone does not know that it does not have alcohol in it, but they expect that they would experience it, and they do experience it anyway, that means they have a placebo effect. So a placebo effect, experimental effects that are caused by expectations about the intervention. In that case of the example I just gave you, the expectation of what alcohol does to people. So the placebo effect is something that we have to understand does exist. So working with the placebo effect, control groups may be given a placebo and an, act, an inactive substance or other fake treatment in place of the experimental treatment. So they get something. So they're not just sitting there, you know, crossing, doing crossword puzzles. They're doing something that may mimic the same type of stuff that the other group is getting. All right, by doing that, they have something in place of the real treatment. The control group is ideally blind to whether they are getting real or fake treatment. Now, let me go communicate this idea. Blind is, means what it says here. A blind group, control group is blind, meaning they don't know if they're getting the real treatment or the fake treatment. Therefore, they don't know whether or not they should be experiencing something or not. So it sort of takes away a little bit of that placebo issue. They're blind to what they're getting. Now, the other type of blind is this. Many studies are double blind. That means neither the participant nor the research staff knows which participants are in the experimental control group. We usually see this in some studies, but we really see them in clinical trials. A clinical trial is like a drug study where they're trying to see if a drug has some impact on a particular issue or disease, okay? And so in this case, the hospital staff, let's say you have to go into the hospital and they hook you up to an IV and they put the IV treatment in your arm and the person who's doing that, the nurse, he or she doesn't know whether or not you're getting the, the drug or the placebo. They have no idea. So if they did have an idea, let's say they knew that you were getting the placebo and every time they hooked you up, you know, and you see they're always like, their lips are trembling and they're crying a little bit because they know you're getting the placebo, not the real drug, that could tell you something. So in order to avoid that, 
they use a double blind procedure. The participants nor the research staff knows which ones are getting the real drug are in the experimental group or the control group. That way we try to control for expectation effects. All right, is there any questions about that before we move on? Now, one of the key things about all this stuff here when it comes to research is about trying to control as much stuff as possible. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to control what's going on during this experiment, control what expectations are, making sure that the groups start out the same. And the only thing that differs is going to be what we do to them, not something else. All right. The next major issue is going to be naming the variables. The variable we are able to manipulate independently of the other variables are doing is, uh, is called the independent variable. That's the thing that we as the researcher or experimenter are going to manipulate. So we're going to either remove the sugar or not remove the sugar. Okay, we're going to introduce the, the, the item that we think is going to cause a change in somebody's behavior or not do it. All right, that's the independent variable. It's something that we are doing. The variable we expect to experience a change, which depends on the manipulation we're doing, is called the dependent variable. So the dependent variable depends on what condition of the independent variable we're at. So that's why they're named what they're named. The independent variable, the thing that we manipulate, is going to have an influence on the dependent variable. That variable depends on the condition of the independent variable. So if we test the ADHD sugar hypothesis, sugar equal cause equal independent variable. The sugar is the thing that we're going to manipulate, whether you have the sugar or not. And the effect is going to be the ADHD symptoms, the dependent variable, the effect, those symptoms of impulsivity, uh, inattention, those things that we talked about earlier. So that's what we're looking at there. So. <clears throat> The other variables that might have an effect on the dependent variable are called confounding variables. So the idea here is that we want to control for as many things as possible. We manipulate the independent variable to see if it has an impact on the dependent variable. That's what we're really interested in. That dependent variable, does it change as a result of the condition of the independent variable? The other variable that might have an impact on it, the confounding variables, we're trying to make sure that we uncover all those potential confounding variables and control for them. So for example, this could be a potential confounding variable. Did more hyper kids get to choose to be in the sugar group? then their preference for sugar would be a confounding variable, preventing this problem of random assignment. So random assignment takes care of them choosing. So let's say for whatever reason, the group knew that they were either gonna be in the sugar group or the non-sugar group, and they chose which group they want to be in. That would invalidate much of the experiment. We don't want them to choose. That could be a confound to the experiment. We want them to be random assigned. They don't have a choice. We want to randomly assign them to one group or the other. Okay, so filling in our definition of experimentation, an experiment is a type of research in which the researcher carefully manipulates a limited number of factors, independent variables, and measures the impact on other factors, dependent variables. In psychology, you would be looking at the effect of the experimental change, the IV, on the behavior or a mental process. And that's what we'll see when we talk about research throughout most of this course. We'll be looking at some IV, some change in the IV, we manipulate the IV, will have some impact on our behavior or some mental process, how we think, how we feel, how we remember, something like that. Now here's another more detailed example, correlation versus causation. The breastfeeding intelligent question, intelligence question Studies have found that children who were breastfed scored higher on intelligence tests on average than those who were bottle fed. Can we conclude that breastfeeding causes higher intelligence? Not necessarily. There is at least one confounding variable that is gonna be genes or genetics. The intelligence test scores of the mothers might be higher in those who chose breastfeeding. So how do we deal with this confounding variable? We conduct an experiment. An actual study in the text, women were randomly selected to be in a group in which breastfeeding was promoted. Okay. 
random assignment controlling for other variables such as parental intelligence and environment. So we had an experimental group which had promoted breastfeeding. Then we had the control group that did not promote breastfeeding. And then at age six, their scores of intelligence were rated. And so this way we eliminate some of the issues that we saw in the previous slide. By this way, we're trying to uncover a few things that could be confound and get closer and closer to what the, the true thing may be for us. The true data is trying to tell us what the truth is, the big T out in the world. Okay, even though it may be this may be the case, it may not be the case for every single person because we only are saying this is what we will typically find in this given scenario. Individuals are different. Individuals are not going to be typical. All right. So the other thing I want to make sure we cover is gives you some examples of trying to identify a few things. But first, I want you to look at this particular classic example. This is the uh, Albert Bandura Bobo doll experiment. Uh, this is something dealing on social learning theory and aggression. So they have a population of nursery school children. All right. And then they randomly assign them to a control group or an experimental group. Then the independent variable, the variable that is manipulated, they are shown a video of an adult interacting with a Bobo doll. And one of the video for the control group, the adult acts in a non-aggressive way with the Bobo doll. But in the experimental group, the adult acts in a very aggressive way with the Bobo doll by hitting it and kicking it and things of that nature. So the independent variable is gonna be which video they saw. Then, to make a long story short, they put the children in a situation where they get frustrated and then they put them in a room with the bubble doll to see what happens. They are measuring the number of hits, kicks, shouts at bubble doll to measure the level of aggressiveness. And the research in this classic study did demonstrate that the number of hits were much greater for those who saw the aggressive role model in the experimental group. So that's how we see the experiment. We have the population, we have the random assignment to the control experimental groups, we have the manipulation, the independent, dependent, independent variables, and then we have the measure of the dependent variable. Now, when they made the control group and the experimental group, those two groups were equivalent to each other. Then the only thing that changed was what video they saw, either the aggressive role model or the non-aggressive role model. Then when they measured the dependent variable, the number of times the number of hits the kid gave to the bubble doll, then they asked the question, what was different between these two groups? The only thing they would say that was different between these two groups, the control group and the experimental group, was which video they saw. Therefore, it gives us a strong case for causation that the video gave them or taught them some aggressive behaviors. All right, any questions before we move on and start to wrap things up here? Any questions? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna let you read this real quickly. I'll read them with you. Uh, name the independent variable and the dependent variable for each one. A good tip for doing this exercise is to first name the two main variables in the study, then figure out which one influences the other. Doing the influencing is the IV and the one being influenced is the DV. So we have a study examining if TV violence increases aggression in children. A study predicting that alcohol drinking will decrease people's reaction time while driving. A study examining if perspective taking improves with age. A study predicting that high school sports build character. How do changes in workspace affect employee reaction? A study predicting that pedestrians will walk faster on hot days versus cold days. And are younger siblings treated better by their parents than older siblings? So I won't belabor this too long so let's go ahead and look at it here so in the first one we have tv violence being the iv aggression to dv and number two alcohol being the iv reaction time to dv age perspective taking high school sports participation and character changes in workspace and reaction of employee temperature and walking speed and older younger your age and treatment so 
again, it's just always good to be able to identify, given a little brief scenario for an experiment, what is the independent variable, the thing that is being manipulated and the thing that is being measured. So this gives us some idea of what the experimenter is doing. A little bit later, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the ideas about uh, research that may help you a little bit more as you do your own research, uh, looking at articles for the future and things of that nature. All right, a couple other things here. Uh, we have a summary of the types of research. So we have research method descriptive to observe and record behavior. Uh, is perform case studies, surveys, or naturalistic observations. Nothing is manipulated. The weakness of the study, no control of variables. Single case may be misleading. We have correlational research method to detect naturally occurring relationships to assess how well one variable predicts another. Compute statistical associations, sometimes among survey responses. What is manipulated? Nothing. And again, it does not specify cause and effect. One variable predicts another, but this does not mean one causes the other. And experimental, to explore cause effect. Manipulate one or more factors, ran factors randomly assign some to a control group. The independent variable is what manipulated. It's sometimes not possible for practical or ethical reasons uh, to manipulate certain types of things. Uh, results may not generalize to other contexts. Now, last thing I wanna cover before I let you guys out of here, I know we're short of time, got about five minutes left here. I just wanna cover real basically some of the key things about ethics, and then we'll pick up the rest on Thursday. Uh, ethics is a very important force uh, in psychology. There are all sorts of ethical guidelines, particularly for those people involved in counseling and clinical psychology. All right, but first we need to understand too, there's guidelines for how we deal with animal research participants. Why do we study animals? Well, to understand species differences and similarities and to investigate treatment of human diseases uh, and, and things of that nature to use in psychological, biological and medical research. Lots of animals are used for those purposes. I know a lot of people don't like it, but they are used for that purpose. And oftentimes it is in the ethical guidelines, how do we eliminate or destroy or euthanize those animals once they've gone through certain types of conditions. So we have all sorts of things to limit as much as possible the tough treatment of animals uh, in inhumane conditions. We want to do that. And so there are rules and regulations based on how animals are to be treated uh, in psychological research. Now, when it comes to human pre research participants, the ethics code and the APA are very important when it comes to research. These are a few things I want you to be aware of. We have the need to have what is known as informed consent. If you have a kid, the parent may provide informed consent to participate in a research study. But as an adult, we need to provide you with enough information about the research study that we're doing so that you have enough information to realize that it's not dangerous to you and what some of the things may happen as a result of you participating in the study. And then you sign informed consent and that's how we had to do that. One of the other key things that we must follow is that we must protect participants from greater than usual harm and discomfort. It is our role as researchers to make sure that we do not put you in any discomforting situation that's going to cause too much stress. We'll see some classic studies in the future that were done before these ethical guidelines and we can see that these participants were put through quite a bit of stress. Also, we need to keep information about individual participants confidential. Oftentimes, we're going to be dealing with subjects that are going to be very sensitive to people, very personal to people. We'll ask them all sorts of sensitive questions. We need to ensure those people who participate that this information will be kept confidential, if not anonymous, confidential at least. And then once the experiment is over, we need to fully debrief the people to explain the research afterward, including any temporary deception that we use. We do that quite a bit in social psychology. That means that we lie to people. We give them enough information so they can have informed consent, but we may mislead them as to what we are really doing in the experiment to remove social desirability factors uh, from their thought process. But then once that experiment is open, uh, over, we have to come clean with them. We must fully debrief them to explain why we may have used some temporary deception and those types of things as well. And then also finally, there's 
guidelines and committees that pr produce guidelines and oversee all the research at a university, usually referred to as the IRB or the Institutional Review Board. And the Institutional Review Board uh, makes sure that everything that is done at the research level is done properly following all the ethical guidelines of the APA and of the university. And finally, we need to also understand this. Researchers are people too. Okay, uh, so as a researcher, your values will influence the topics that you choose as you will choose the topic or the article for your current event paper a little bit later. The color, the facts of observations and interpretations may be hidden or unconscious, but one of the key things that researchers do at oftentimes is try to find out what their biases are, what their tendencies are, so they can try to avoid those types of things uh, in the future. Okay, I believe that is it for now. Uh, are there any questions before I let you guys get out of here? If you join us a little bit late, please be sure to send me a present so I make sure that I have you in my attendance. All right, any questions? Any questions or comments so far? Sorry for my alarm, it's 2.30 now. Okay, if there's nothing else that you guys need from me, I'll post this a little bit later. The notes for this session are already posted already. I'll have this video posted shortly. If there's nothing else for you guys, I'll talk to you later and see you on Thursday. Take care, bye.